Morning Springs. My name is Elena and I'll be reading Acts 5, 1 through 11 this morning. If you're willing and able, we'd love to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried out and buried him. After an, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. Good morning, y'all. Hey, welcome to Springs Community Church. If I have not had the chance... To meet you, my name is John. I serve as pastor here at the Springs. I'd like to start by sincerely saying welcome. Now, one of the things you might have noticed in the reading right at the beginning is if you grew up in church, we are reading, we are spending time studying today the oh-so-exciting, the ever-enticing, great story of judgment of Ananias and Sapphira. Merry Christmas, <laughs> right? Now, before we jump into the text, and I do think this is a text that really does highlight how Christmas can be merry and bright, sincerely. And I'll show you that as we navigate through it. I want to start out, though, by, by just asking a question, okay? It's just a reflection. You don't have to yell out. If you're very brave, you can yell out, but I wouldn't recommend it. When was the first time, your memory, when was the first time you remember just straight up lying? deceiving. Someone said every day. That's honesty and it's welcome here, right? I remember mine, and I would really say like a, like intentional deception, you know, like hypocrisy. And I can remember mine. Mine was in kindergarten. Kindergarten. I was an overachiever. I really was doubling down early in my youth. Here's what happened. I go to kindergarten. I would get a note home from the teacher. Teacher would send a note home with me because I did something wrong in class, typically behavioral, something like that. I could remember, I would take that note. My teacher said, John did something wrong. I'd take it to my, my parents. My mom was an educator, a wonderful, amazing woman, very involved in my life, she and my dad. Well, they would get the letter that John had been disobedient, and they would lovingly, appropriately bring healthy discipline into my life. Normal, normal, normal. Well, I could remember, after the first time I did that, I got a second note from the teacher. Now, this teacher... Maybe she was new at this. She didn't think how deceptive a young kindergartner could be. She did not require a parent to sign anything and bring anything back, right? Rookie mistake. I would take those notes as she entrusted this goodwill to me because maybe she's like, man, this young man is a future pastor. I could trust him. No. No, you couldn't. I would take these behavioral notes and I would crinkle them up, and I had a dresser. I threw them behind my dresser. There I am, a kindergartner. I'm an evil genius in the making, thinking, I'm getting away with this. My system is foolproof. I, how many times I do that? I don't know. Three, four, or something like that? I can remember, though. Halfway through the year, we'd been living in an apartment. We moved out of the apartment and into a house. Yes, yeah, some of y'all know where this is going. I remember in my evil genius kindergarten brain the day where I realized movers have come. I can remember sitting on the bus, and I'm telling you, it is in my body, this memory of like, I have to get home. Why? I have to move the notes from behind the dresser because if mom finds the notes, if dad finds the notes, it will not go well with me. And I can remember literally coming home from the bus, running up the apartment stairs to my room in the room being blank. And immediately I'm thinking, maybe the movers. Somebody's gonna perhaps even do me a solid. <laughs> no. I don't remember if it was that night or sometime to come, but it felt like it was short. 
my mom went to read me a book. And this night, she happened to pick out a book. I have a, a picture of that book right <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. My mom, she was with it. She reads this book, short story. The premise is the young bear gets in trouble at school. And then all of a sudden, he decides to avoid telling mom and dad, goes to grandparents. It's this beautiful story of integrity. My mom reads this to me. I see the book, and I start to think, does she know? No, she doesn't know. Does she know? Yeah. Everyone's like, she knows. Yeah, she knows. She knows. Spoiler alert. I remember the moment my mom said, hey, John, I found the notes, the notes that were behind the dresser, and just twist in my stomach. Now, from that moment, I don't remember some great discipline. My parents are great. They just met me in the moment. But here's the question that I start with. What was my greater sin or evil? Or maybe say, let's say you prefer the term wrongdoing. Was it the fact I had gotten in trouble at school with some form of behavioral issue like a kindergartner? That's not good, but that was not the great sin. The great sin in the moment was me coming home day after day, acting like things were fine, when in fact, there was this building sense in my tender little kindergartner heart of duplicity, or to say it more sinisterly, hypocrisy. I was hiding things. The reason I share that is it exemplifies this theme. My parents, of course, they are after a better behaved kindergartner, but that's not what they're after. They are after the heart. And in that moment, it betrays and it shows where my heart truly is. The reason I start with that is today we are continuing our series through Acts. We are looking, if you're familiar with it, at this historical account of Ananias and Sapphira to where if you grew up in the church, you are familiar with this is a severe moment of judgment. It's one of those when you're like spending time reading God's word, perhaps you're up in the morning, you go to have this moment and you just turn to the next page and if you're familiar with Acts and where it's gonna go, you come to this and you're like, wait, what just happened? You like wanna read it again? It's a place where we see God dealing with hypocrisy. Now here's why this matters, right? Here's why it matters. There is a practice and a premise in the Christian faith that really goes this way. Honesty, integrity, Authenticity, whatever word you want to put to it, let's just say honesty, brings intimacy. Where God says, I am God. I know all that is in you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You can choose to hide, but it's a foolish choice. I'm inviting you not to a life of moral perfection where you're supposed to always do the right thing, say the right thing, think the right thing, I'm inviting you to a life of honesty, where when it goes well and you happen to do the right thing and following me, well done, and when it goes wrong, you have enough bravery to believe that your honesty with me will be met with honor and not condemnation. So there's this principle and theme throughout the scriptures. Honesty brings intimacy. We might use words like authenticity, vulnerability. Let's put all those in it. But here we are going to see a counter truth in scripture. We are going to see what is the dark side of honesty. The dark side of honesty is, yes, deception. But oftentimes in a religious or a church or a Christ-following setting, it's hypocrisy. Instead of seeing how honesty brings intimacy, we get a counter illustration through a negative example. And the example that we are going to see today is the severity of hypocrisy. The severity of hypocrisy. Now, why does this matter? Like, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus or you're not, you might know that where's this word hypocrisy come from? Hypocrisy, it's everything you think it is. It's saying one thing and doing another, right? But it's acting like you are meeting a standard and projecting it onto other people when you are willfully, knowingly not meeting that, and you're okay with it. Hypocrisy, it came from a person who in a play, a hypocrite, was someone who would wear a mask because they would play the part, they would pretend they would be a hypocrite. Hypocrisy is any area of your life or mine, especially if you're here and you are a follower of Jesus, where for whatever your reason, fear, insecurity, distrust, you feel safer in a mask than you do fully known. 
in the rhythm of scripture is inviting you and me to set aside our versions of self-comfort, self-salvation, self-protection, all the selves, and instead inviting us into a different place of trust where we say, God, you can have my mask. That's why your soul, whether you're a Christian or not, this idea, an invitation of what it means to belong, you ache for, I ache for, to be fully known by someone and to be fully loved by someone. Rejecting hypocrisy is taking off the mask and having the bravery to be honest and God meeting your honesty with a sense of intimacy. But it's something that comes really hard for us. It can be challenging. It requires great faith. Because at the core of it, what you're really doing is this. I have to believe by faith that God cares more about the real me than the pretend me. Many of us, we go through life spiritually pretending. You put on a good show, like it is literally, we have language for this in the church. It's like your Sunday best, where we try and we put on a facade or a front, but behind that facade or front, we honestly feel like an imposter. The Christian journey away from hypocrisy does not mean you have to come and have a perfect marriage, a perfect life, perfect parenting, perfect morals, perfect entertainment decisions, perfect drinking patterns, perfect eating habits. It is not an invitation to perfection. The opposite of hypocrisy, if you're a Christian, the opposite is not perfection. The opposite is living a life of repentance. That's what Ananias and Sapphira miss out on. Let me show you what I mean. Hypocrisy is saying, I am doing the wrong thing. I know I'm doing it, and I'm going to keep doing it as I'm acting like I'm not doing it. Repentance by faith, if you're here and you're following Jesus, repentance is a good word. Repentance is, I am doing the wrong thing. And by the Spirit of God in surrendered mercy for the forgiveness he gave me, I'm turning back. It is an invitation to wholeness. See, you and I have a tendency to hide from God. And he wants you and me to know through this dark example with Ananias and Sapphira, our hiding will never lead to our healing. But his presence brings his blessing. You'll see that in the text, but it is through a dark, heavy, daunting illustration of deception in Ananias and Sapphira. We'll see it in Acts chapter 11, verses 1, or excuse me, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, as we just look at this theme of the severity of hypocrisy. And we have to see this severe, because you and I, Christian or not, we all have areas of like tolerated hypocrisy. And the invitation today for you and me is, you got to be honest. You got to be honest. But we'll see that through this narrative in three ways. The first is going to be their deception, the deception of Ananias and Sapphira. The second that we are going to see was Peter's invitation. It's this beautiful moment that though they have this evil in their heart, Peter is inviting them into the light. There's always an invitation into light. But then we will see God's judgment, but we'll look at it through a biblical lens and really see what it was. In response to their deception and the denial of Peter's invitations, you will see God bring protection protection to his church. That shared, if you have a Bible, jump with me to Acts chapter 5. Again, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. The the context you need to know as you're turning there, though, is last week or two weeks ago when we were in the book of Acts, here's what we saw. The state of the union where the apostle Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he described the church. That's a people. That's not a place. That's not a building. That's a people. And it was miraculous the way he described them. But ordinary. What I mean by that is he said, what marks this people of God, this amazing sense of unity? The language used in the text was of one soul and of one heart. So they have this principle of unity, and then they have a practice that demonstrates it. The practice is downstream of the principle of unity. Their practice was radical generosity. It was this taste of heaven where literally people with abundance saw people in need and not out of compulsion, not out of demand, not out of obligation, but out of delight said, my abundance can meet your need. Here, take. Which in first century was a total 
counter culture. The kingdom of heaven showing a tangible way that our way is God's people. We're not better than, we're not self-righteous, but we are invited to live differently. And when we do that well, it is divinely attractive. So what you'll see today is a contrast. Ananias and Sapphira, they do not have a principle of unity, but they have a principle of, of lying, of hypocrisy. Because of that, they will not have a practice of generosity. They will have a practice of greedy. But that shared, join me in reading the text. One, one final note. Some of you are like, man, it's December. It's like Advent. Look at all the Christmas trees. Can't we do like a beautiful just Advent series? Like, let's mix it up. Joy to the world. Lights. I love the lights. Hey, let, let me show you this. One, I get it. I do. Two, uh, the Holy Spirit, through one of the great apostles, John, would talk about one of the purposes of the Advent season. It's in the book of 1 John. He would literally say, for this reason, the Son of Man came, which talks about Jesus' incarnation, his birth, the moment where he left the throne room of heaven to the manger to then live this perfect and sinless life for you and for me. And he talked about part of the reasons why Jesus would do that. Why would he do that? In the language of the disciple who self-describes as the one whom Jesus loved, he says, for the Son of Man came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, I know that language for some of you when I say devil, it's jarring, it's uncomfortable, it's perhaps even unfamiliar. Just stay with me. I want to show you, though, the part of the way that you and I grow in an Advent season is learning the invitation between light and darkness. Like as you see Christmas trees or you drive past beautiful lights, the beauty of the light is the contrasting darkness. In this text is an honest invitation for you and for me to say, one of the ways that I experience, I model, I live a Merry Christmas is I say, the darkness of my life, Lord, I bring it to the light. Would you take what was once broken and make it now beautiful? Shine brightly. So it's with that disclaimer, Merry Christmas, Happy Advent. All right. I'm going to read Acts 5, 1 through 4, and we're going to quickly go through this text. A man named Ananias, the irony here, this means God is gracious, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, which means they were fairly wealthy, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the pro proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is a contrasting example to the radical generosity of Barnabas just verses prior. But continuing on, Peter is going to address Ananias. But Peter said to Ananias, said, excuse me, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Peter is shocked. He can't understand why, why, why? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So we are looking at, as a counterexample to honesty, building intimacy. We are looking as a counter, negative illustration in Ananias and Sapphira of the truth, the devastating severity of hypocrisy. But the first theme that we're seeing here, you have to start with hypocrisy, there's a lie. It was their deception. You have to see from this text, Ananias and Sapphira planned and plotted to try and deceive both God and his people. The language that you'll read in this text is the church. Again, the church is his people, his covenant group saying, help me in sacred unity, follow the king. But in order to understand why would they deceive, we first have to understand who they were. Who were Ananias and Sapphira? I would put before you this. They were a believing, saved, to use our language, but not following, married couple in the early first century church of Jerusalem. Here's why that matters. In order to understand this context, you have to either view this from the lens of, were these folks not Christians or were they Christians? I'd put before you, they are emphatically Christian. You will see them in the kingdom of heaven. Now that brings out two things. Well, they are meant to be judged so severely with death. John, how can you think or why might you say 
that they are son and they are daughter. Well, here's the thing. I think they probably were, and the more I've studied this, I'm closer and closer to saying they definitely were, but I can't explicitly say that. Why? Because the text doesn't. But here's the reasons it leans this way, and you and I need to understand this. First, were they saved? One, they were a part of the church family. That same context before carries over now. Two, they knew the Holy Spirit. Three, Peter somehow happens to know their names personally, which with anything hints to, the church in Jerusalem by this point is of thousands. They might have been there from the beginning. Four, Peter is shocked that they would lie to the Holy Spirit. If they are not followers of Jesus, Peter would not have been shocked that they would lie to the Spirit of Christ. And five, Peter is asking them about why would you have done this sin? If they were not followers of Jesus, Peter would not be asking them, why did you do this sin? Peter would be sharing with them the gospel of Jesus. May I tell you, there's a God in heaven who forgives and cleanses of all sin. He would be sharing the gospel, not asking them about their guilt. But for those reasons, I submit to you, I believe they're sons and daughters. So that takes us to, okay, if they're sons and daughters, what did they do that was so wrong? Was there great sin that they sold their house and they kept some of the proceeds? If you remember back in verse 4, Peter literally is outlining these questions. No. There's nothing to do with selling a house and keeping some of the proceeds. Peter's literally saying, you could have kept the house. You could have kept the property. You did not have to sell a thing in order to follow King Jesus. The second thing then is like, okay, well, was there great sin that they gave only part and not all? Was it they kept some of the proceeds but gave some? Was it kind of like a lukewarm type vibe? Was there a sort of but not all the way? Peter, again, emphatically, he's saying no. He's saying you could have kept all of the proceeds. You did not have to give any of it in order to join this family, in order to be in unity with us. What was their great sin then? Their great sin, as Peter describes it, why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Contrived, they plotted and planned. This is premeditated. But what is it? They are wearing a mask. They are pretending it is pretense. Their great sin is their hypocrisy. They have come before a community of faith wanting to be honored and celebrated perhaps for their generosity or wanting to hold on to their finances in order to act like they could be okay in their heart. We all know what it's like to hold on to money for a sense of security. While we don't know exactly what motivated them, we all know what it's like to try and come and have, one, have a group of people think something about us but on the inside, we know, well, that's not fully true. Whatever their motive might have been, Ananias and Sapphira are explicitly committed to public pretending. Hypocritical worship. Now, here's why this matters. The church of Jesus Christ has faced threats externally. The Sanhedrin, ruling group of people, don't tell them about your king. Don't tell them. But now, now they are facing an assault internally were to use the language of the apostle Peter, he is saying, Satan has come and you have embraced his lie. What was the lie? Ananias and Sapphira, in this moment, for their hypocrisy, they are believing this, this. Anytime you and I embrace hypocrisy, we are, we are believing this. The lie that hypocrisy, saying one thing, doing another, right? Acting like we got it all together, but the lie, it's a sham, right? We've all done it, you're there too. Christian or not, you are in this boat. That hypocrisy is less costly than integrity. That hypocrisy will cost you less than a life of integrity. Let me show you what I mean. I know that's kind of like philosophical. Stay with me. To a degree, that's true. When you and I choose to hide a moment of hypocrisy, here's what's happening. We are avoiding a short-term consequence. Hoping. Praying foolishly dreaming that it will all work out in the long term. We are avoiding, we are choosing a short-term gain. And as we do that, we are embracing long-term pain. I did that with silly notes behind a dresser and then a moment with my mom. I have done that in moments where I've hidden in deception with others 
and then later on it finds out. But the other thing that's true, even if it's never found out in this life, there is a God who promises one day it will be revealed. But you and I, we have a tendency to believe this lie that hypocrisy is somehow easier than integrity. But scripture will show you that's clearly false. Proverbs 10.9 is a beautiful, haunting, and healing verse I remember memorizing like 10 years ago. It says this, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. So that's one path. But he who makes his way crooked, modern translation, lives in hypocrisy. He who makes his way crooked will be found out. Now, I want to show you this. There's a theme of integrity where it says, if you walk in integrity, you walk securely. Securely here literally means in the Hebrew, free from anxiety and unhealthy fear. The Spirit of God through the wisdom of Solomon is saying integrity will literally make you feel happy. Do you know that when you lie and you conceal, the American Psycho Psychological Association has found in, in research studies, literally what happens is you produce a stress hormone in your body. Cortisol is secreted. That's what gives you over time that nagging sense of guilt at a neurochemical level. They have also found what happens. He who walks with integrity walks securely. Securely, freedom from anxiety and unhealthy fear. When you and I come and have a spirit-led bravery to actually be honest, and we confess, more chemicals are released. Except in this moment, that chemical is oxytocin. That's why for some of you, you have had the sacred moment where you have broken trust with someone, with God or with others, where you have sat there in honest confession of guilt. And then you have been met with an embrace. Where what was once this great fear has all of a sudden become a foundation of a new sense of sacred intimacy. You and I are literally hardwired for integrity. But we somehow think, ah, hypocrisy might be easier. I, I, I shouldn't tell them. I don't have to bring it up. That's too much. My son, he's three. He's totally working through this. He loves marshmallows. And when I say like loves marshmallows, I literally mean he will lie, cheat, steal, and I'll tell you the story, to get marshmallows. Now we have marshmallows in our pantry. Now they're up on a shelf. Why? Because we are responsible parents. My three-year-old will get a stool, this tiny little stool. He will carry it in secret because he knows he's not supposed to do this. He will take it into the pantry. He will set it down. He will step on the stool. He will then climb up, you know, like pantry shelves right there. He will climb up pantry shelves. They will totally rip out one day. He will climb up pantry shelves to get the marshmallows. Now while he's up there, is he a thoughtful thief? Does he just take one? That way the evidence is managed. No. He's taken handfuls. Handfuls. And where literally he'll eat it, and then the evidence is on his face. In my darker moments, I kind of want to go to him and be like, dude, i got to teach you how to get rid of evidence, man. <laughs> and then I'm like, that's a terrible idea. Right? But here's the thing. This past week, there's a moment my son has snuck, and I know it. I ask my boy, hey, Tripp, Come here, buddy. He comes, and my son, I'm not even kidding you, marshmallow in his hand. He somehow happens to think in his mind, he takes it and he hides it behind his back because he's covered in marshmallow. Why? Because he thinks, well, daddy can't see it. I absolutely know what my son has done. And I say to him, hey, Trip, did you go and get marshmallows when you know you're not supposed to, buddy? No, daddy. No, I didn't. That's our hypocrisy before God. He is fully aware. And then I asked him this past week, another time, hey, son, I want you to know, not telling the truth to daddy, that's the worst thing you can do. I'm going to ask you one more time. Hey, buddy, did you go and take marshmallows? Yes, daddy. Here's the reason I share that as an illustration. Again, in my son's heart, what's the greater sin, stealing the marshmallow? No, it is the deception the hypocrisy. And I can, and I get, he's three. He's three. But you literally train in your heart to tolerate duplicity or hypocrisy, or you experience the joy of integrity. Ananias and Sapphira embrace the deceiving lie. The hypocrisy is easier than the integrity. Where we've all had the moments where in God's grace we are exposed or found out. Or if you sit here and you never have you live with like crippling fear that one day you will. 
That is the opposite of walking securely. He's not trying to have you exposed, found out, and shamed. He's trying to invite you into health. Ananias and their deception experience the severity of hypocrisy when they are distrusting God. Ananias forgot what his name meant. That takes us to the second theme of this text. Read with me. I'll go verses 5 down through 10. Peter's come, he's asked these questions, and he says, when Ananias heard these words, uh, you have not lied to man but God, excuse me. Verse 5, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and he breathed his last. Great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Uh, Simple side note, this is the first time you see in the New Testament the strength of use put to a righteous task. Now, many of these apostles were under the age of literally 18. So these youth right here, 13, enough to be considered a man, especially in Jewish culture. But their job, they were not in the room for the moment, but they are brought in. They wrap the body. They carry the body. They will bury the body. It is sobering. The text, the tone of the text is meant to feel heavy. Continuing on, verse 7, after an interval of about three hours. Why three hours? That's how long it took them to carry to bury, and to come back. His wife came in, this is Sapphira, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Modern day translation, please tell me the truth. She responded, yes, for so much. She has an opportunity for honesty, and she doubles down in hypocrisy. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test, this will be a key word, to test the spirit of the Lord? Uh, A fascinating theme in here. I wish we had more time. There is a beautiful example of the Trinitarian fellowship of God, where you see the Holy Spirit, God the Father, Christ the Son, all coexisting, the spirit of the Lord. They are lying to the Holy Spirit, which is lying to God himself. But that's a talk for another day in a more positive tone. That shared. Behold, The feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. What ominous words. They will carry you out. Immediately. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. The depth of their hypocrisy is met by the immediacy of God's judgment. He was fully aware. When the young men came in, they found her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband, which is fascinating in a few ways. The young men come in. That means in this moment of confession, two things are occurring. Peter is honoring the fact that confession is a sacred thing. It's done in smaller, not larger groups with trusted people. The second thing that you really see here is a beautiful dignity that's extended to Sapphira that in first century culture was not common. She is judged individually from her husband, Ananias. She could have just been lumped in And he gives her a unique dignity before God because the Bible always does that. Gives her opportunity to follow where her husband fell. But that takes us to this text where there's two moments, first with Ananias and then with Sapphira in this heavy reality where Peter is giving an invitation to honesty and they double down in hypocrisy. But remember, what is the opposite of a life of hypocrisy? It's a life of integrity, not perfection, which means they do not have to have it all together. But they have to know they're so loved, so already forgiven, they can be brave enough to share a hard truth for a healing moment. But in the moment, what do we see? Peter discerns how Satan has filled Ananias' heart with lies And those lies will cost Ananias his life. See, here's the idea, guys. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, biblically, let's go spiritual warfare for a moment. Satan cannot possess you. You are indwelt with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is far more powerful. But what is true, even though indwelt with the Spirit of God, you can be filled, controlled, led, influenced by the lies of Satan. Ananias... Once living in truth, walking in the spirit, is now living in the flesh, walking in a lie. And he has once 
what was a beautiful place of shalom and peace in his heart, he's now allowed a lie to grow into an insidious garden of pain. He has welcomed it. And one of the things that happens for you and for me, like believing a lie, not living a truth, is the counterweight to say that. Believing a lie has consequences. And here, believing lies has victims. That's true. And then he comes to, An or, excuse me, to Sapphira, Ananias' wife. And Peter can't grasp why she is, to use the word, testing God's grace. When, let's turn the phrase, she is meant to be resting in it. She is exploiting the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of her sins and Ananias. Let me show you what I mean. The expression went from Ananias to, how are you lying to the Spirit? To now the expression changes to now you are testing the Spirit. The expression shifted. Testing in this moment, this word in the Greek, it means testing how far you can go with something and still get away with something. I'm sure none of y'all ever did that. Or you like have that moment, I've done this with employers, people, friends, spouses, parents. Why? Above average sinner. You're welcome here because you are too. That shared, it's where you push it and you push it and you push it. In that moment, Ananias and Sapphira are testing the grace of God. In order to test something, you have to know it's real, but you're wondering how far God will let you take it. It's like looking at the love of a father and saying, I know you're going to love me even if I do this, so I'm just going to keep doing it. And there's two things that are true. God will love them through it. And that is crushing to the heart of the father. It's crushing. Prior to God, though, bringing great judgment, you have to see in the text Ananias and Sapphira have an invitation out of it. Like this text, if they come and they absolutely come and live a life of confession, this is a narrative in the story of healing. Like prodigal son, son returns home, a narrative in a story of healing. But in God's sovereign plan, Ananias and Sapphira will instead be used not as a story of exemplary healing, but as a deep, dark, and scary warning about what happens when you and I, especially in the unity of a church family, when I tolerate my sin, when you tolerate your sin, and yet we tout or express, well, I'm not a sinner. That's why in response to sin, Ananias and Sapphira had this, and you do. In response to our sin, we are always extended an invitation out. Yet they deny it. God is offering healing and freedom, but they are choosing to stay, in the New Testament language, the slavery of their sin. Like when we sin in response to that, every person here faces two things immediately. Two things, maybe not immediately if you're not aware. The first is a decision, the second is a temptation. A decision, a temptation, right? Here's what I mean, a decision. You've just given your heart to sin. The question then comes, well, do I confess this as sin to God? It means you've got to acknowledge it was wrong. Do I confess this as sin to other faithful, sacred followers of Jesus? That's the decision. The word confess is not to shame. In the Bible, it means to acknowledge. To confess, it's you and me standing before, like my son hiding a marshmallow. God fully knows there's a marshmallow, right? Confession is acknowledging for my heart. It's for my benefit, not for God's. We're faced with a decision. The second thing we are faced with is a temptation. The temptation usually comes where it's like, man, you don't have to tell. It's not that big a deal. Telling would honestly, it's just for your benefit. You'll probably even hurt them anyways. It would be a selfish thing. That's my favorite. Where all of a sudden we begin to sit there and rationalize away why that, that tiny little part that like embeds in the conscience isn't worth sharing, isn't worth being honest with. And really what we're doing is we are turning to the choice of we can hide or we can trust God as father and healer and be honest. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm returning to this theme again, you are not commanded to have moral perfection, never say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, say the right thing. That's not the invitation of Christ. 
The invitation is that would you have the bravery to rest in the fact you are forgiven, you are loved, you are a son, you are a daughter, you are an heir, you are cherished, you are loved. And from that, Father, I have sinned before you. I'm sorry. I thank you for my forgiveness. And then, telling it to another. The telling this to God and the telling this to another marks the health, by the way, of a church family. This is what also takes, if you're here and a member here and you're in like a community group, most of you are probably in, and I'm not trying to be rude, you're in a small group. You're in a group of people that are managing their appearance of others, that are managing what they share and confess. They are scared to be fully vulnerable. Why? For two reasons, two reasons. There's a distrust with God, right? Because he says you're loved, you're forgiven, you're free. It doesn't matter what they say about you. Walk in a trust of me, not a fear of them. Maybe I'll use that your confession to be their healing and invitation to a different way out. So there's a distrust here. And then there's a very well rationalized, well, I, they would never do it. Nobody else is being honest, so I'm not gonna go first. Well, I think they should, or I'm just waiting. Or I remember when that time when I was hurt. And don't get me wrong, there are some really good reasons. We will hear them, we will meet you in counseling. You have to steward this. But what I'm telling you, at the end of the day, intimacy comes with honesty. God and others. And it cripples small gatherings of the church where literally you stay a supper club small group and then act like you're doing what Jesus calls you to do. No way, Jose. I don't know why I brought in Jose. If you're here and your name's Jose, I'm not speaking to you personally. It's an invitation to a different life. Seeing the text, you gotta view Peter in this moment is inviting them to come back. I love a quote. It comes from Henry Nouwen. He was a Catholic priest, famous writer. He's passed away since. He talks about this, this invitation to honesty, to vulnerability. And he, he says it this way, to confess your sins to God is not to tell him anything he doesn't already know. You will never surprise God. Until you confess them, however, they are the abyss between you. When you confess them, the abyss becomes the bridge. Like you will never want to meet with God more than he wants to meet with you. He already knows the past, the present, the future, the dysfunction that you're like, I'll take to my grave, or the tiny small sins that right now you are too scared to share but he has so much holiness and integrity that when he comes, he's not gonna tolerate your duplicity. He's not gonna come and interact with you like, okay, well, here's the righteous version of John, like the Sunday version, but then there's the other part of John, the like scared, um, fearful, trapped version of John. No, 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 no. The spirit of God says, I get all of John. So John, you might wanna put on a play, you might wanna put on a facade, you might wanna put on a front. I won't bless it. And I will wait for you. And I will woo you. And I will send my people to you. And you will learn that you could trust me. Jesus, Jesus was the safest person on the planet for a person in their sin. Safest person on the planet for a person in their sin but he would never let someone think it is safe to stay in their sin. You track with that? We have a huge culture like safety. What does that mean? Jesus was the most approachable. You could not shock him. He's God. Literally, invitation after invitation, prostitute, demon possessed, thief, stealer, betrayer. He's like, come one, come all, I got you. But the people who wanted to tolerate their sin, Jesus had no tolerance for it. But you and I, we're in a culture where we think, well, I gotta put on a show, I gotta put on a masquerade. No, 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 The duplicity kills the intimacy. Ananias and Sapphira planned it in advance. They were given an invitation and a way out and they double down in their deception despite Peter's invitation. They stayed trapped. 
when he wants freedom. But now we see God's severe judgment. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. 11. Well, they, they both die. Okay, they both die. Right? Great fear came upon the whole church. This is the first time the word church is used in the book of Acts. You gotta, church means gathering, ecclesia, people, not a place. People, not a place. And upon all who heard these things. So what has happened? You saw this earlier in the text in response to Ananias. Great fear came. And then you see it down below. Great fear comes upon the whole church. We have seen what started it, their deception. They're doubling down in hypocrisy. We saw, despite their deception, Peter, God working through him, his invitations to come home, to repent, to believe truth, not live a lie. That's what repentance is. It's not a shaming term. Biblically, it is a healing term. And then finally, though, in response to their deception, in response to their denial of invitation after invitation, you see God's protection, his protection. Now, why would I describe it as protection? God severely judges Ananias and Sapphira to protect the church in its stage of spiritual infancy. God severely judges them because he is protecting the church in a time of major transition. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, stay with me, right? But for a little Bible study, all throughout scriptures, Old Testament and New, you see a theme of God that in certain times of transition with his people, he will bring judgment more severely or harshly. Why? To use the language of the apostle Paul, dear friend and counterpart to Peter, Paul will say, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So if in a tiny part of God's people, a little sin creeps in, over time, that little sin will come to corrupt the whole. Deal with it when it's a little, or it will deal with you when you are a lot. To get this rhythm and a vision of what this looks like, you see this as an example like Leviticus chapter 10. Israel has been brought out of Egypt. God has implemented a priestly class to introduce how to care for him and one another. These priests come and they have a tabernacle, a place where the presence of God dwells. There's two priests. Um, Nadab and Abihu were these priests right at the very beginning. They are meant to model purity, holiness, and honor. And instead, in the sacrificial system, they offer sinful sacrifices. God kills them immediately. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, there will be a lot of other priests that will come and offer sinful sacrifices that he will not kill immediately. Why is he dealing with them so severely? He is protecting this at a time of transition. A second place you see this, the people of God, from that moment, about 400 or so years later, they're going into the promised land. There's this famous moment where God says, I'll fight for you, depend on me. Don't steal their idols. Straight out of the gate, there's a guy named Achan who steals an idol. Straight out of the gate. The next chapter, literally, they go to fight a battle, they lose the battle. People are like, what happened? They pray. And God gives an invitation saying, it's because there's sin in the camp. Those false gods will kill you. Don't tolerate it. And you see the text in Joshua 7 literally go from an invitation. All of Israel tell the truth. All the 12 tribes tell the truth. All of this tribe tell the truth. All of these clans tell the truth. This family tell the truth. And Achan doubles down the whole way in his deception. He is then stoned to death. You get this rhythm and theme that God is preserving something. This is a unique and formative experience. He's saying, no, no, no. If sin enters in now, if Satan's lies introduce now, the unity of my bride will be corrupted. A little bit will destroy a lot of it. He is protecting. In elevating fear, fear is a righteous biblical word. It means I care more what God thinks than what Springs Community Church thinks about me. Holy Spirit, help me to care more what God thinks than what my wife thinks of me. Help me to care more about my trust in you than what my bank account states, whether or not I can pay for college for my kids, whether or not there's a retirement plan waiting for me in the future. Let me rest in you. You are the one that I, by your help, and I'm gonna need your help, I have to prioritize you at the center of my everything 
Help me love what you love. Help me hate what you hate. And if you don't help me, I won't. A righteous fear of the Lord is prioritized. Reverence. It's saying, my heart wants to bow at false gods. Money, sex, food, gluttony, self-righteousness, emotional immaturity, avoidance, being a bully. You pick your thing. If you're like me, and you are, you got a couple of things. But instead, Lord, you are the king. By elevating fear and reminding we care about the Lord, God's doing three things. He is protecting the unity of his bride. The second thing, the testimony of his church. Testimony, if they are living, if they're saying one thing and doing another, they lose total trust with the community, the city, the world. That's what happened. The American church has lost total integrity with a non-believing world. Why? Because we said one thing and we did another. We judged them without judging ourselves. It didn't go well and it shouldn't have. Trust is the currency of ministry, and hypocrisy kills trust. So in protecting, he is, he's protecting the unity, the testimony, and then what is he always after? Intimacy with a soul. Here's what we've seen. Here's what we've seen. You and I have an invitation to intimacy with literally the creator of your body, your soul, your spirit. He is real. Jesus is true. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a Christmas fable. He is God. He knows you and he loves you. You and I have a choice. We can live in hiding or we can take a step of spirit-led bravery into healing. In order to do that, what is demanded and required is enough bravery to joyfully think. Honesty just might be worth it. Honesty just might be worth it. Ananias and Sapphira, they are a testament to the opposite, to the counter, to the shadow of this. That there is great severity and consequence of my hypocrisy, of your hypocrisy. You know this in your own life. Like I could come and talk to you about the things that you don't want me to know, your spouse, your friends, your community group, your parents, whatever, where you kind of hide it back and it's literally costing you Many of us carrying that lie is exhausting and crippling and your body feels the weight of it. If he is a good father, do you think he wants you to live that way? He wants your blessing, your peace, your shalom, your hope. But I can choose to hide. We saw their deception. We saw Peter's invitation. No, 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 no. Come, come, tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. And then because they were not willing to allow the Spirit of God to use them as an example of healing, in the sovereign plan of God, he used them as a warning. Um, The final thought for me is about Peter. Peter. Because you and I in this moment, wherever you are, you face this choice, whether you are Christian or not. Will you allow the Holy Spirit to evoke a sense of bravery, to be honest about the things that you want to hide? For some of you, that is great extremes. We will help you here. We will honor your confession. You will find safety in this church family. But in the same spirit of Christ, you have to know it is okay to not be okay, but it is not okay to stay there. Especially when we say we follow a God of healing, of love, and of light. It is an invitation out of shame and into sonship. But you got to think about Peter. Like if he was here and he was giving this sermon, how would he give it? What would be his tone? Would he be like, can you believe Ananias and Sapphira? Like, what was his tone when he was meeting with them when they were brought into the room? Was he like, how dare you? How could you? Why would you? Like, you know, we kind of view churchy or Christian people or the American church kind of like shaming their spiritual ivory tower looking down on. Was that his vibe? I don't think so even a little bit. I think you get a hint from the text. Peter starts with Ananias and he says to him, why has Satan filled your heart? 
And in this moment, Peter with Ananias, and it's implied with Sapphira, is using Satan in a rebuking, concerning, correcting tone, calling him back out of darkness. Stop believing the lie and an invitation to truth. The last time Satan is referenced in a rebuking, a concerning, and a correcting tone. Peter was not saying it to someone else. It was Jesus Christ saying it to Peter. Peter, Satan, get behind me. In a moment of Peter's doubt, denial, and disbelief. Peter in this moment is he is before Ananias and Sapphira. You have to wonder, was he the most intimidating person to confess to or the best person to confess to? I'd put before you, no one would have understood what it meant to use the language of Satan is filling your heart with a lie. Tell the truth. No one would have gotten that more than Peter. Because the last person who spoke it to him would have been his king, his savior, his brother, his friend. And so he has in this moment two things. He has empathy. Empathy is not sympathy. Sympathy is when I hurt for you, but I've never lived through that. Empathy is when like, no, no, I feel pain with you because I know that pain. He has empathy, and from that empathy, I can only imagine this moment is marked by like sacred mercy. If you are here, you have a choice before you, a decision. You will face that decision when in a moment following our prayer, we partake in communion. Are you honest about the things in your life that keep you? from the life you really want. For some of you, will you even take those communion elements and not worship today by taking them? But will you go and make peace with other people where you acknowledge not just your sin to God, but your sin to them and take the elements with you? They're portable. And after you make peace, worship in communion. But we have a choice as a church family. We have a choice if you're here and you're a follower of God. Is honesty with God, even if consequence may come, is that better than hypocrisy with God and hypocrisy with others. As a man who has tragically lived the dark side of that and by the grace of God triumphantly live the beautiful side of that. With Peter, I can confidently tell you it's so much better trusting him than it is hiding from him. Let me pray before our act of communion. Lord, we thank you for your word and its truth. We thank you for its power and just what you have done in our lives. Uh, Holy Spirit, those of us here who know you and love you, we invite you to come and discern the darkness of our heart. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, just in your seat, silently and privately to yourself, I invite you to take seconds of silence and have the bravery to say, Holy Spirit, show me what's holding me back from you. You're invited to do that now. I invite you, if you want to continue on this brave quest of intimacy with God, for the courageous followers, to then come in response to that hypocrisy that he's shown you, confess that to God with sincerity in the biblical language of contrition in your heart, as you make ready your soul for the righteous act of communion. Take that time now, privately to yourself. thank you that for however many souls endeavored on the journey of bravery to say, Spirit, show me, and then Father, I confess. That as we come now in this triumphant procession of communion, they would feel this overwhelming reminder and sense of hope that they are loved, forgiven, 
new, beloved, chosen. Holy Spirit, you are the one that in our hearts give us the cry of Abba, Father. Would you let our spirits feel that now? It's in your name we pray, amen. It's with that I'd like to invite those of us who feel led to worship through the taking of communion now, but I also give honor to those of us who the next righteous step is taking this and going in confession and peacemaking with another. You'll take it later and God will honor you. But for those now in this moment, I invite you to remembering this truth of God, that wherever you are, if you believe in him, this is a reality of your life that Jesus Christ came and he broke his body for the forgiveness of your sins, that he loves you. He wanted nothing to separate you from him. Not Satan, not the grave, not hell itself would keep you from him. And what did he give? He gave everything, the body of Christ broken for you. The other promise that we Christians have is not just a sense of forgiveness, but you have to rest in God not just forgives, he delights. Like he's proud of you. If you have sat here with a heart of bravery to say, I just want to follow, like he delights, he resonates. He wants that to keep going. We come and we partake of the wine in the sacred remembrance of like there is a new hope, there is a new covenant, there is a new love. He is always wooing, always calling me. The blood of Christ shed for you. I invite you now to join me in participating in a beautiful moment where we watch, where we hear the testimony of a wonderful young man named Caius prior to his celebration of baptism and the close of our service. Join me here by watching the video. Proclaiming that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I understood the gospel at a pretty young age. I said yes to Jesus when I was four years old. It was on Christmas Eve and it was in my parents' bedroom. I was only four, but I understood the gospel. Uh, that Jesus died for my sins so I can have a relationship with God. Even though my idea of God was that I thought he was kind of scary, I knew what I was doing and I knew that even if he was scary, he was good. As life went on, my understanding of the gospel became deeper and it started to impact my everyday life. People said I was gifted at academics and I took a lot of pride in that. I liked being gifted because it made me stand out. People said I was smart, but even then, I still sinned and made so many bad decisions that hurt people, especially my family. If I, someone who other people thought was smart, could go and make so many mistakes, then the one who is smarter and wiser than me, and any other human, must be the one who is worthy of following. That was very humbling, but also very freeing. God is going to make things work out. I don't have to worry if I can figure it out, because God has already had it figured out since the beginning of time. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you. When I thought of God as a father, I thought of him as a father who expected me to move out when I was however old and be all self-sufficient, but that was wrong. He is forever my father, and I am forever his child. He wants to provide and meet all of our needs. We're supposed to rely on his strength, not our own. At four years old, I understood enough of the gospel to know that I needed Jesus to be my savior. If that's all you know, bless your heart. That's all you need for a permanent relationship with the Father. Uh, but at 17 years old, I have a deeper understanding of who God is and how the gospel applies to my everyday life. I also, even then, have so much more to learn and experience. If I could share one thing with everyone, it would be that you are not strong enough, but God is. We all make lots of mistakes, but God doesn't. Trust God, not yourself. I'd like to invite Caius, his friends, and his family up onto the stage where we celebrate his baptism. As they are making their way up to the stage, there's a few things you all need to know. Baptism is a beautiful picture of everything we've talked about. It is a tangible statement 
of an inward transformation, outward sign of inner saving faith. Where in this moment, Caius will come and he will be fully submerged into the water showing his old self is gone. He will be raised in a newness of life in proclamation, I am loved. This action does not save him. If he does something, he will not be unsaved by it. But it is a public declaration for his soul to God and us as God's people of following God's way is always worth it. But it's with that, I want to hand it over. Oh, the microphone's over there. It's with that, I want to get a microphone, and then I will hand it over to Davis, Caius's community group leader, and this family up here where Davis will share a few words. So I've gotten the privilege to get to know Caius over the last, what, three-ish years? And, man, it has been a privilege. It's been an honor to just get to know you, to get to watch you mature. Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the impact you've had in my life, my wife's life. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for just being you, man. God is using you, and he's going to continue to use you. Mm. And it has been just a joy to get to know you. And so I just want to thank you. You can go ahead and get in. Here, let's face you the other way. I'm, I'm all about pageantry, okay? Come on this way. Sit a little forward. There you go, man. Take a seat. We love it. Family, if y'all want to come around the water, I'll hold this as Davis just speaks truth over Caius. Caius, why are you here, buddy? Um, uh, to to uh, show that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and that his way is best. Mm-hmm. Man. Well, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah! Bless y'all. If y'all want to head on down that way, please give one more round of applause. That is, uh, for those of you in our church family that know the Hamels, love the Hamels, know Caius, love Caius, that is sacred and special on a lot of levels. That shared, here's what I hope you've seen today. We all are tempted to hide. Caius, in his own way, was tempted to hide. You are. The Christian journey is not a life of perfection and moral superiority. It is a life of intimacy with God. You are invited to that here. If you have no one to hear your righteous confession, come. I will. Our prayer team will. The elders of this church family. Members, if there's lines that are too long, just come down and you start hearing confession. Because here's what you will be met with. Love. You are so loved. Online, thank you for joining us. In person, thank you for joining us. Y'all have a wonderful week of worship. We'll see you next Sunday.